You may not know this, but this is a tough season for me. There is a deep, deep division in my staff. They have taken different sides, believe in these different parties. They are passionate and verbal about their side and have a hard time understanding other people's belief systems. And it's only because of the love of Christ and my great mediating expertise has there been peace. And that's what's behind the scenes. I just wanted you to know. One staff member, assistant pastor, Steve Page, firmly believes in the New York Yankees, while executive director Chris Pan believes in the New York Mets. And Steve would say he's not really threatened by the Mets because he sees them as not even in the major leagues, as they're like a triple-A minor league team, while Chris sees the Yankees as the evil empire. And Steve is shocked and answers, we're the evil empire? No, the Boston Red Sox are the evil empire. They are the real threat to the country. But then I point out that Garrett Sullivan, the elder of our personnel team, is from Boston, and he's a citizen of Red Sox Nation. I also point out to Steve to remember that Garrett's personnel team decides our salaries. Then Steve gets quiet, which is a miracle, because as you know, speaking softly is not really one of his giftings. Only in Christ have I been able to keep our staff together. As for me, I'm a Yankee fan, so much so that I can even name every player and position of the entire first string of the 1963 Yankee team that featured Mickey Mantle, Yogi Berra, Roger Maris, Whitey Ford. Hey, my family's from New York. But what I really care about is the San Francisco 49ers. And not to pick on the East Coast, but yes, the New England Patriots are the evil empire. And I'm so tired of them winning so often well, not that much until this season, I mean. And on the West Coast, those darn Seattle Seahawks are always in the way of our fun. But seriously, there are other things that are far more critical that are dividing our nation. And I want to talk about how we can be agents of unity, messengers of peace and truth, and as I said last week, ambassadors of hope. This past week, in getting ready for our nation's inauguration of Joseph Robinette Biden Jr., I decided to read the second inaugural address by President Abraham Lincoln. Only seven minutes long. And I know some of you are thinking, hey, you could take a tip from Lincoln on that, Dan. God will get you for, that, for thinking that. The Lincoln, this Lincoln Address is on the north wall of the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C. And some say it was more important than Lincoln's first inaugural address. Because on March 4, 1865, he spoke to a divided nation and desired healing. The Civil War was still going on, though near its last gasp of air. And clearly, both the North and the South did not trust each other, and many still hated each other. Worse yet, both sides believed God was on their side. He looked out at the crowd of black and white people, knowing that there were still many in slavery. How could he bring a divided nation together? President Lincoln said in his address these words, in great contests, each party claims to act in accordance with the will of God. Both may be and one must be wrong. God cannot be for and against the same thing at the same time. In the present civil war, it is quite possible that God's purpose is something different from the purpose of either part. And yet the human instrumentalities working just as they do are of the best adaptation to effect his purpose. God called the people to a higher purpose. For me, it all came together in the very last line of his inaugural speech. With malice towards none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right as God gives us to see the right, let us strive on to finish the work we are in to bind up the nation's wounds. He was a man for peace. Sadly, he was assassinated 41 days after giving this address. Friends, we are on the 
brink of a new chapter for our nation. We have seen a division in our country that we have not seen in a long time, which erupted in a breach of the U.S. Capitol building with an evil intent to endanger our lawmakers and damage property. I ask our community that from this day on, that we must work harder to have malice towards none with charity for all. I have just three things to say today. Number one, be unified. Number two, be thoughtful. And number three, remember the resurrection. When Abraham Lincoln pleaded with our nation for unity, he was so concise in saying that the only way that would happen is if we would have, uh, all have malice toward none and charity and love for all. Even inside the Christian community, in our church, we can be deeply divided over politics and over this last election. But for Christians especially, Jesus desired that the believers, his followers, must not, must be not if they want to be, but must be in unity. In the Garden of Gethsemane, before he was crucified, Jesus prayed fervently to our Heavenly Father and said this about us Christians. He said, and now, I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I'm coming to you. Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me, so that they may be one as we are one. I know it will be hard for our country to be unified. Both sides believe they are right. Those who attacked the Capitol thought they were right in defending the Constitution. They weren't right, but they thought they were protecting the country. The fact is, we should be rooting for our rivals, where we actually cheer our competitors, those who are on the other side, for the sake of the greater good. Now, how can that be? I know that sounds counterintuitive, as the movie Princess Bride would say, inconceivable to actually root for those who we oppose. Rooting for rivals is actually the name of a book by Peter Greer, the CEO of Hope International, a global Christ-centered economic development organization serving many of the continents. He's also a friend of Hawaiian Islands Ministries. He will, in fact, be speaking on opening night of the Hope Rising Hymn 2021 conference on March 15 to 20. Peter Greer contends in his great book, that collaboration and generosity increases the impact of leaders, charities, and churches. I kind of wish all the lawmakers in Congress would read that right now. They would get so much more done working across the aisle. We know for a fact that when groups of pastors in Hawaii united to have their churches sponsor children every month through Compassion International, the walls of denominations and competition fell. Today, more children are sponsored in Hawaii per capita than any other state in the United States other than Colorado, where Compassion is headquartered. Peter Greer wrote this, when we consider coming alongside others, we can, just, we can go beyond just fighting extreme poverty to thinking about ending extreme poverty beyond rescuing young girls and boys from human trafficking to putting traffickers out of business, beyond translating parts of the Bible into just a few more languages to translating the entire Bible into every language. Peter tells a story. This is from the business world. He tells the story of David Lynn Klaus, who owned a vacation rental company. And as their company grew, they saw more and more rival vacation rental websites beginning to emerge. Homeowners started to get confused with all these listing sites. So traditionally, what do you do? You hunker down and you fight the competitors. But no, get this. This is what David and Lynn did instead. They invited 10 of their competitors to a meeting to discuss the problem, competitors. Only six of them showed up, and in the end, four of them collaborated to launch renters.org, a free online booking calendar and guest book that allowed property owners to enter their information just once instead of multiple times on multiple sites. And get this, 
Over the next five years, the leaders of those four companies would continue to meet twice a year at a vacation rental property to discuss better ways to collaborate and work together. They became actually good friends. Eventually, the Clauses sold their company to a company called uh, Homeway, and today, Homeway, VRBO, and Airbnb are household names. The power of unity and collaboration was helpful to all, even competitors. So how can we, we be unified? Point number two, we'll start to answer that. Be thoughtful. Thoughtfulness is one of our church core values. Remember our acronym, PATHS? P stood for presence and A for authenticity and T for thoughtfulness, H for humility and S for service. So this is a time when we really need to pump up that core value of thoughtfulness to slow down and really think about what is truth and what is not. When we don't think it through, we can believe it's okay to attack the Capitol building. One Christian who attacked the building told a reporter that he had asked God three times if he should go into the building or not. But he said he didn't hear anything from God, so he went in. That person needed to be thoughtful of whether Jesus was really telling him to join a crowd that was trespassing, destroying property, and endangering the lives of both the police and lawmakers where people died. We are living in a day when people's lies can pierce into our homes and living rooms and bedrooms through social media and some very dishonest news sources. We must learn to be thoughtful and test constantly the news sources we listen to. One of my favorite scripture verses by which I try to abide is 1 Thessalonians 5.21. It says this, But test everything, hold fast to what is true. We must get into the habit of really testing everything, but hold fast to only what is true. There are conspiracy websites and links that we need to avoid. Did we ever test them for accuracy and with God's eyes? What is really their source of information? Are they just making it up? I would say, just stop. And hey, for those of us who listen to other news sources, whether CNN or BBC or the New York Times or Wall Street Journal or Newsmax or Fox News or PBS, always, always, always test everything and hold fast only to what is true. I'm always analyzing the slant, the bias, and looking for objectivity. Every news source has a bias and a point of view. And what bothers me about those who follow conspiracy theories is that they don't anal analyze who the sources are, and so these sources could be flat out wrong or making things up. Part of my checklist in knowing if something is God's will is this. Does it really follow the princi principles of the Bible? Or B, have I slowed down to pray and really listened to God and not my own beliefs? Or C, what do my spiritually mature friends think? Or D, can I imagine Jesus whispering in my ears to do that? Or E, use common sense. If any action in our lives would contradict what the Bible says, then don't do it. Is it of the world or of the word? Is it of the flesh or of the spirit? If it leads to malice and not charity, then it's not of Jesus. Of course, this first point assumes you know what the Bible says, or at least what the New Testament says, or at least what the Gospels say, or, or the Epistles say. But don't tell me you, you haven't read any of that if you are judging others. Or at least what the book of Proverbs says. For Proverbs 18.2, Fools find no pleasure in understanding, but delight in airing their own opinions. 
Have you ever been to a dinner party where people just like to air their own opinions and not listen to other people's point of view? And by dessert, when they eat their bonbons, you are ready to say your bye-byes? Fools, says the Bible. It's not cool to be fools who just think they have a pool of knowledge that they spool when they're really just jiving and diving with saliva around their Godiva. Hey, I know what you're thinking. Maybe I can be the next poet laureate for an inauguration. And if we get peeved, if we are naive in ignorance of the guidelines of the Bible, then our political views, our personal lives, our families, our business, our social lives are doomed. It would be as crazy as driving a car and disregarding what the maker of your car wrote in the car manual. Oh, I think kerosene would be as good as gasoline for my gas tank. Oh, I think it doesn't matter what grade of oil I put in my car and if it stank. Oh, I think 60 pounds of pressure for my tires is better than 35. Oh, my speedometer goes up to 110 miles per hour. I guess that is the speed I should drive. Why read the owner's car manual? Bzz. You have just entered into the not smart zone. God is the car owner who created the car. He is the Lord, the owner of our lives, our bodies, our souls. So why aren't we reading the owner's manual? the Bible. And there's so many Bible app, apps out there to help us, so we have no excuse. The Bible tells us the guidelines, the fences in which to live a life of freedom. And if we don't follow them, we will ultimately crash. You can't outthink the Creator who created you. Don't tell me you spend hours in conspiracy theories when you don't know what the Bible says of how to have malice towards none with charity towards all. A trust in God will reduce fears. He is telling you how to live, how you should handle money, how to have healthy relationships, and when to have sex, and how to protect the environment. He may not tell you how to fill out your tax forms, but in terms of charity, he does tell you to render unto Caesar what is Caesar's and unto God what is God's. And since God knows everything, why try to fool him? He sees our every move, knows our every thought, and yet we think we can go around him? Fools, says the Bible. Second, I said to really pray and listen to God. You know that guy who said he, he prayed and then he didn't audibly hear from God to stop? So he stormed the Capitol. He was wrong. His check and balance was to talk to a spiritually mature friend to evaluate his prayer and what he perceived was the answer to prayer. If I were to hear a husband say he prayed and he felt God told him to beat up his wife, I would clearly say he is not listening to God. I mean, use common sense. God doesn't tell us to rob banks. God is not telling us to attack the U.S. Capitol. He is not telling us to cheat on our income tax. He is telling us to have malice toward none with charity for all. And I always try to imagine, is Jesus really whispering in my ear to do that or believe that? When people feel like cutting themselves, I want to say, do you really think Jesus is telling you to do that? He isn't. You are of great worth, he would say. And when one has a low self-esteem and does not feel loved or useful or beautiful, I want to say, do you really think Jesus is saying that to you? Because he would never say that. And if you read the Bible, you would know that. And so those voices must be coming from another source that is not of God because he thinks you're of great worth and you are beautiful. Being thoughtful also means to be open to changing your mind and admitting you are wrong. And I know that's hard for a lot of people. You know, I never tell people who I will vote for or have voted for, not even my kids. And today, I'm going to break that policy. I'm not a Republican nor a Democrat nor a libertarian. I am a true independent. And just, I just vote on the person who I 
think is best. So in the election of Barack Obama versus John McCain, I voted for John McCain. And right now, you Republicans are saying, I knew there was something about Dan I liked. I liked McCain. He had character. He was willing to work across the aisle. He was respectful to Obama during the heat of the campaign, especially in a town meeting I once saw. He was a POW, and I, and I admire all POWs, especially Jim Hickerson and Jerry Coffey in our church, as well as Carol Hickerson, who helped design the POW MIA flag. They are my heroes, and I support the armed forces. But today I'm listening on audiobooks the memoir of former President Barack Obama called A Promised Land. I'm more than halfway through. And I now see that he had a lot more character and integrity than I dreamed. He was thoughtful in his decision making, trying to do the right thing. He was a much greater leader than I thought in so many ways. And my Democrat, Democratic friends are saying right now, gee, Dan, duh, about time. I say this in humility, that all of us, we need to be open that we, at times, are wrong. I say this in that in being thoughtful, we need to always know both sides of an issue. There are many facets of a person or a subject or concern. Makavalu, as the Hawaiians say, uh, maka meaning I and valo meaning eight. The Hawaiians are saying, look at an issue in eight ways, as if with eight eyes, makavalu. You know, we can all have blind spots. We often need more eyes to see clearly, more eyes, clearer vision. In, in humility, we can say we were wrong about a person or a party because we only had one or two eyes. We can be more charitable. We can be more thoughtful. We should be open to change our minds. Makavalo. Now, let's review my, my three points. One, be unified. Two, be thoughtful. Three, remember the resurrection. Yes, it's in the resurrection of Jesus Christ that we have hope. Remember the resurrection. It's when Jesus, uh, who was crucified by evil people, uh, was brought back to life. People talk about the phoenix that rises from the dead ashes. This is more amazing. Our hope is based on the fact that's not fake news, that Jesus Christ died for the sins of humanity and came back. Death lost its sting. He broke the curse so that we might have a future in this world and the next. Jesus died hoping that we would understand that God came to this earth to give us a new way of living. It was Jesus who really talked about malice for none and charity for all. When we get mad at a political party, or a politician, or a boss, or an employee, or a friend, or a family member, we can make that person an enemy. But the resurrection of Jesus shows and proves that Jesus Christ is a true king, not a prime minister, or a president, or an earthly monarch. I love what Chance the Rapper says, don't believe in kings, believe in the kingdom. Let's not get caught up with earthly kings and kingdoms. Jesus promised he would give us the Holy Spirit, a real divine being to live in us and around us if we follow Jesus. And that would mean we would have the supernatural power to forgive the unforgivable, to love the unlovable, to be patient and kind and generous and have charity for all. Hence, when Jesus says in the Bible, tells us to forgive everyone, love even your enemies, turn the other cheek, let God do the vengeance and not you, help the poor, the isolated, the unloved, the immigrant, we can do that because God can give us his Holy Spirit and his power to do that. You know, honestly, humans shouldn't ever fight each other because we are not really each other's enemy. Peter Greer wrote this, and I quote him, when we think of other organizations as our competition, 
we are choosing the wrong villain. We should fight and struggle, but not against one another. The competition is poverty. The foe is injustice. The opponent is our own sinfulness. The enemy is the evil one. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, the Apostle Paul writes, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. The words of Peter Greer. If we could only remember that the true enemy is not a person or party, it is Satan the evil one himself, Lucifer. And if you don't believe in the devil, then it means he has already won half the battle in your life. I close with remembering one of the last scenes of the Will Smith movie, Independence Day. In the movie, there's a huge enemy alien force from outer space that is bombing our planet. And the only way Earth will survive its blistering attack is if all of the countries that were rivals and enemies of one another would band together to fight this one common alien force. And so the Brits and the Israelis and the Arab air forces with Asian and Latin planes all joined the United States and together they flew up and met and defeated the enemy. Friends, the real enemy is not a person or a party or another country. It is actually Satan behind the scenes. So quit fighting each other and get your eye on the ball. If we really want peace in the, in the United States, true freedom, then we all need to rely on the Holy Spirit and ask God to give us his power to root for rivals, to urge for unity, to stop being so darn devices, divisive and paranoid and fight the real enemy of dissension in our ranks. And when hate rains down, we will put up the parasol of peace that protects and rejects and deflects the poison of division. And may there be the multiplication of many who stand for malice towards none with charity for all. For then, and only then, will we have our true Independence Day of freedom and hope and a real inauguration of love. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord, to live a life, especially with such a divided country, to have malice towards none with charity for all, it's going to be hard. Mean words were said. Bad actions happened. But Lord, come Holy Spirit, come into our lives that we can love the unlovable and forgive the unforgivable. And if there are people here who are saying, okay, Dan, we want to join this movement of love, but we know we can't do it. We don't have the human power. May they just join me in a prayer and saying, okay, I'll commit my life to walking a life with Jesus. So Jesus, come on in to my life. Holy Spirit, this one that Dan talks about, Holy Spirit, come into my life. Lead me and guide me. Show me a new way of living and loving. So Lord, we pray this to you. In Christ's name, amen. And now, please receive this blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you. May his countenance be upon you. And may you know deep in your heart the wonderful love of God the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit who gives us the power to have malice towards none with charity for all. God bless you. Amen. Ahui ho. See you next week. Bye-bye. The Iron and Deb Johnson, coming, coming to you to from beautiful... <laughs> you keep wanting to say live. Okay, that's one. And now, a sip of water. Living water. 
One take for all of them. Give us some dad jokes. <laughs> I don't have any dad jokes. I, I used to live in Waikai, so I used to go up Makapu Trail and love the view from the lighthouse. It was awesome. Uh, yeah, that's good. <laughs> they would eat this. Who are you most excited to hear from? Oh man, I haven't looked at the speaker list yet. Why whenever I preach, it sounds like I'm farting, but I'm actually not. It's just my stomach grumbling and the microphone picks it up. That's a too long of a title. That's, that should just be um, embarrassing moments while preaching. Why we can't say fart jokes in the outtake might be another one. <laughs>